Welcome everyone to today's ANSYS Virtual Academy session. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's session is going to be presented by me. I am the CFD application engineer, Yarit Kativ. And uh, today's session is going to be geared more towards CFD users. Like JD mentioned, uh, we're going to be focusing on the watertight uh, geometry guided meshing workflow in ANSYS Fluent. Uh, for today's session, I will be covering some topics verbally and then doing a short demonstration. So I'll just have one question and answer session. So as and when you have your question and answers, you can put them down in the Q&A box and I will take them towards the end of the presentation. So with that, let me jump right in with the agenda for today's AVA. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about ANSYS Fluent Meshing, some of its features and capabilities for those of you who are not aware of Fluent um, or you know, are beginning off with CFD. And then we're gonna specifically talk about watertight geometry workflow guided meshing in ANSYS Fluent. I'm gonna be doing a demo for the surface meshing using this guided workflow and then eventually move on to the volume meshing part. So before I go to the watertight geometry guided workflow, let me talk briefly about fluent meshing in general. I know that I did an AVA a few weeks ago, uh, which talked about the fluent solver. Um, and I talked about the different physics that fluent can handle. And since fluent is such a well-known CFD solver, I'm sure all of you already know about its solving capabilities. However, for those of you who are beginning off with CFD, you might not be aware that fluent meshing is also quite powerful. And you can use it to get very high quality, accurate meshes for your 3D geometries. So just want to elaborate a little bit on the capabilities and features that you stand to uh, gain from when using fluent meshing. First of all, let's talk about the user interface. If you want to make your simulation workflow convenient, you'd like everything to be in one place, right? So Fluent Meshing allows exactly for that. You have a single window workflow in which you can go from CAD import right up to post-processing. You have your CAD prepped up for simulation, you import it in the Fluent interface, you surface mesh it, volume mesh it, set it up for simulation, solve it, and then do post-processing without having to step outside the Fluent environment. So it becomes really convenient, especially for new users. Second, um, in the recent versions of Ansys Fluent, uh, we aim for something called a task-based workflow. What is a task-based workflow? Suppose you're not a CFD expert or a meshing expert, right? You want to reduce the burden on the end user to come up with manual meshes that both need to be optimal in terms of cell count and also quality, right? So what Fluent Meshing does is it has these guided workflows that take you through the step-by-step -step process of setting up these meshes. So anyone can start off with CFD meshing without being an expert. And it also reduces your overall time to solution. In today's session, we will be especially talking about the watertight geometry meshing workflow in ANSYS Fluent. This is useful for clean CADs or clean geometries that have already been prepped in another software such as ANSYS Space Claim. I did an AVA a few weeks back, uh, you know, how to prep your geometry for CFD using ANSYS Space Claim. So if that is of interest to you, you might wanna go back and watch that, right? And what if your geometry is not clean? What if it is complex? It has too many components. You do not want to manually go in and you know, uh, fix all the holes or the leaks or the gaps. Then Fluent has an option for that as well, wherein it offers you a wrapper-based workflow for meshing dirty CAD. That is called fault-tolerant meshing workflow. And we are gonna be reserving that for a future AVA session. Also available to you with Fluent Meshing is the capability of parallel processing, right? So if you are handling big, large geometries 
wherein you expect the cell count to be really high, then you would want to use multiple cores to be able to distribute the meshing processes over these cores and reduce your meshing time. So Fluent allows you to do that now. And most importantly, I want to talk about the Mosaic meshing technology, which is patent pending uh, and exclusive to ANSYS and that can be used for optimal meshing to generate high quality, um, fast meshes with the optimal amount of cells um, in different regions. I have a few slides lined up to talk especially about mosaic meshing technology, so I'm going to be discussing that. And these are just some of the basic features that I want to talk about in today's session, but this is not all that fluent meshing has to offer. It has um, much more advanced capabilities uh, for advanced CFD users um, that you can uh, utilize for uh, different applications. And we can again cover those in future AVA sessions. So mosaic meshing technology, why is it of importance to us? What do we stand to gain from leveraging this technology? Now, the word mosaic, um, I'm sure you guys must have seen floorings in your house or other buildings. I know I grew up to have mosaic uh, meshing, a uh, mosaic flooring on, in my house. They're basically combinations of tiles and glass. They look very pretty. You have, you know, very nice patterns. And that is why, you know, the name has been borrowed. With the mosaic meshing technology, fluent meshing has been able to accomplish something extraordinary. What mosaic meshing allows you to do is it lets you transition from different types of elements in different sections of your computational domain by using transition layers of polyhedral cells. Now, why do I need different elements in different sections of my computational grid? Well, because it's not one size fits all. All CFT users know that, you know, there are some element types that are more suited for such certain regions of your computational domain. Like for example, ideally, I would want hexahedral cells everywhere in my domain, right? Because they're gonna give you the highest quality and they're gonna reduce the cell count significantly. But if your geometry is complex, if your surfaces have um, high curvature, then those hexahedral cells are not able to conform to those high curvature areas. Right? So what do you do? You tend to pack more hexahedral cells, right? Just to conform to the geometry. Now that invariably um, exceeds your computational time because the number of cells in your domain, uh, that increases. So we cannot use hexahedral elements everywhere. What we would like ideally are prism layers near the boundary, which are able to capture those high gradient regions and able to capture the boundary wall effects, right? So mosaic meshing technology lets you combine these hexahedral elements in the interior of your computational domain with polyprism boundary layers near the wall region with the help of a transition layer made of polyhedral cells. And what you end up getting is the best of both worlds. You get best accuracy and least amount of time. So you are basically trying to get the best quality mesh with the least amount of cells possible so that your mesh is optimal. Now, traditionally with tetrahedral cells, you would use triangular prisms, but because polyhedrals have more faces, it's better to use polyprisms in this near wall region because that effectively reduces the cell count. And like I said, your hex core meshes would definitely benefit you in terms of quality and solve time. And remember, all these connections that are made, they're conformal. So mosaic meshing technology is really something revolutionary and everyone should be leveraging it and get started with fluent meshing to be able to use this for their own applications. Here are some examples that I uh, grabbed from the ANSYS database that show how powerful mosaic meshing technology can be, especially for, you know, complex um, mesh regions. In this first example over here, you see a generic aircraft body, and you will notice these polygon cells on the surface, but the hex elements in the uh, bulk of the computational domain. And then you have these really nice, you know, polyprism layers near the boundary to capture the near wall effects. 
Same goes for this F1 wing over here. You have your polyprism layers near the boundary. You have your hex elements in the interior and then a polyhedral transition layer. Over here in this example, this is actually a very narrow gap around one millimeter. But notice how mosaic meshing has been able to capture uh, all the curvatures and you know, uh, create like really fine and really coarse elements and you know, transition them together using this particular technology. So notice the jump in the cell size from the near wall region to the interior region. And same goes for this air balloon over here. You have a one to eight ratio of cell size jump from this region to that region. So all with the help of a thin layer of polyhedral cells, I'm able to um, get such good uh, gradations between my uh, smaller cells and larger cells. So point is that mosaic meshing is really powerful, especially for complex geometries where you want to um, generate high quality meshes without putting in a lot of effort and a time. So with that, uh, let us delve into watertight geometry workflow meshing specifically. Uh, that's the topic for today. And this specifically focuses on clean CAD geometry. So when I say clean CAD, like I mentioned earlier, I mean that there shouldn't be any leaks. There shouldn't be any holes. It should be a closed computational domain, whether it be a solid domain or a fluid domain, right? So you can import that right in ANSYS fluent meshing and then go on to generate the surface mesh by assigning local sizing and global sizing, and then eventually generate the uh, solid and liquid regions. Now these solid and liquid regions can be generated um, in the CAD tool itself. Like for example, space claim is capable of doing this step, but in case you're not using space claim or you haven't done the step in space claim, you have the option of creating these regions in Fluent itself. And then you eventually generate the volume mesh. Once your meshing is done, you can switch to the solution mode and directly use the solver and then go on to post processing after you get your converged results. So easy enough to follow, very intuitive, anybody can do it. So with that, let us look at the demo example that I'm gonna be focusing on today. What you see here on the screen is a clean CAD for a static mixer. Um, this has already been cleaned in space clay. I have made it translucent, but it's all solid. It's all closed solid regions. Notice I do not have a capped fluid region because I thought as an example, we could see how that is done in ANSYS Fluent itself. But uh, like I demonstrated in a previous AVA session, you could cap this in space claim as well. So this has um, two inlets, one over here and one over here, and then one outlet. What we're gonna do is import this clean CAD in ANSYS Fluent, add the local and global sizings, perform the surface meshing, cap it to extract the fluid regions, and then finally use volume meshing and utilize the polyhex core mosaic meshing technology just to demonstrate how um, easy it is to generate a high quality mesh using Fluent. With that said, let me go ahead and start the Fluent launcher. So I had this minimized already. I'm using 2020 R1, which is the latest Fluent version. And I'm gonna be starting the launcher in the meshing mode. If you were to just use it for setting up a simulation, you could directly go to the solution mode if you've already meshed it. But for this example, we're gonna be starting it off in the meshing mode. Also notice that it gives you an option of selecting the number of cores uh, for your parallel meshing. So I have used eight cores right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and start Fluent. So this is the user interface for ANSYS Fluent meshing. Looks slightly different from the ANSYS Fluent solution mode. Um, if you remember in the ANSYS Fluent solution mode, you would have uh, different tasks for setting up the simulation. Here we'll have different tasks to set up the mesh. 
So for today's session, since we're doing the watertight geometry workflow, let's jump right in um, and let's select our workflow type. So I go over to the scroll bar and I select watertight geometry. Now notice as soon as I select watertight geometry, I have these top to bottom tasks outlined, right? These are the same tasks that I just talked about in a previous slide, broken down into individual steps. They're very easy to understand, easy to follow. So, you know, if you're starting with CFD meshing, ANSYS Fluent is one of the best ways to get started because you could just simply follow this workflow and uh, the result is a beautiful mesh that meets all the criteria that you'd want. So you go ahead with the first step and start with importing the geometry. So let me click on that. Once I do that, it'll ask me for the units. Now I'm gonna keep it as millimeter, but you can choose to uh, you know, select a different unit based on the mesh that you're working with or based on the geometric dimensions of your CAD. So let me go ahead and select the file. And it's gonna take a little while for the geometry to load. While it is loading, I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll. This poll is for anyone who's interested in the fault tolerant meshing workflow. If you would like to see a future demonstration video or an AVA session for fault tolerant meshing, which is for Dirty Cat, um, please make sure that you know you fill out this poll that will help me select the topics for future sessions. So I think some people are still voting, so I'm gonna keep the poll on. And in the meanwhile, you can see that my geometry is all loaded. This is a space claim file, so it has a .sc doc extension. So if you wanted to see the cross section, let me go ahead and insert a clipping plane right here. And you can see the inside of the geometry. Right. Hey Snake, but you mentioned space. Uh, you import this from Space Claim. Uh, what other CAD files does Ansys Fluent Meshing support? So um, Ansys Fluent Meshing. So if you go to the import geometry, it supports a lot of different CAD formats. But I would recommend that if you are importing your geometry for you know uh, either fault tolerant or for watertight geometry workflow then I would recommend that you actually get it in space claim first and then get it to uh, ANSYS Fluent Meshing because there are different formats, but when you assign selections or name selections in space claim, uh, there's a guarantee that they get carried over to ANSYS Fluent. However, if you're setting your named selections or boundary names in some other CAD software, there might be a chance that they're not carried over so it's better to, you know, do the intermediate step of, you know, transferring it to space claim first. Does that answer your question, JD? Hello? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. All right. Excellent. So let me see. I think I'm going to end the polling. So 95% of the people who... Uh, participate in the poll to want to fall tolerant meshing uh, AVA. So that's good. That eases my job. So thank you everybody for participating. So let's go to the next step then. So once you finish a task in this workflow, you'll see a green check against that task. So that means that you've successfully finished it. So you can move on to the next step. So the geometry has been successfully imported. I'm gonna now move on to add local sizing. Now add local sizing is an optional step. Suppose you're just starting off with CFD meshing, you don't really need to uh, play around with it or you could play around with it, but uh, point is that you know it's not necessary for you to add local sizing. 
if you know that you know there are faces or areas where your mesh needs to be finer or you need to capture more gradients that's when i'd uh, suggest you go in and add your local sizing so for this case i have these holes right here and i know i want a finer mesh around these holes so i'm going to go ahead and select yes and when i select yes it'll ask me to add the local sizing Usually it'll ask me to assign a name to the sizing and that's just a general good practice for CFD, especially if you are gonna do a lot of different local sizings, it helps you to keep a track. So I'm gonna go ahead and write drum holes and I'm gonna select the space control type as face size. I'm gonna keep it as it is and I'm gonna make this two millimeters instead of one millimeters. And I have to select the zone or the uh, face on which I'm applying the size control. So you have the list of labels that you've created in Space Claim. So you go ahead and select drum holes over here. As soon as you hover over it, like even before clicking, it gets highlighted in the uh, GUI. So you know which location you're selecting. So I'll go ahead and select drum holes. And notice when you select something, so suppose the selection has already been made, and if I zoom in, you will see these green preview boxes, right? Now, what are these green preview boxes? They basically let you assess how small or how big your cell size or your element size is gonna be in that location. So suppose if I change this to five, so you'll see that these preview boxes grow. So that lets you understand what kind of sizing to expect in a particular zone, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and add local sizing. It takes a while to update, but once it's done, you'll see a green check against it. Now, the next thing that I wanna do is add a local sizing to this particular blue region which we're gonna call the body of influence. Now I'm gonna pause a little bit here and talk about what body of influence actually means, right? Some of you may be familiar with this term, some of you may not be. Now body of influence is any region in your computational domain that is not actually participating in your simulation. This is not this blue region over here, this blue cylinder is not actually a part of my CAD geometry. But the reason I have this blue domain here and I created this in space claim is so that I can assign a refinement factor to this particular region. That means if I want to have any domain in my, uh, any region in my domain wherein I'm expecting high gradients and I want a finer mesh in that particular region, I can simply create um, an enclosure around that particular region and assign it as a body of influence. When I assign it as a body of influence, Fluent knows that it is not actually participating, that these are not actual walls, that you will not get boundary layers at these boundaries. So this is just for including refinement. So I'm gonna create another local sizing for this particular body of influence, right? So let me name it as BOI. And instead of selecting face size, I'm gonna choose body of influence. So this is where I tell Fluent that, hey, this is a region of refinement. This is not actually a part of the geometry. And let me see what kind of size I assign to it. So this is the uh, maximum cell size that I'm uh, asking Fluent to uh, keep in this particular region. And then I'm gonna select this region. So when I select this region, you again see those uh, green boxes that tell me how fine the mesh is gonna be. I'm actually gonna increase it a little bit, uh, just for the sake of example. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and add local sizing. And notice how as soon as the green check mark appeared against BOI, that blue region vanished. 
the reason why the blue region vanished is because now Fluent knows that, hey, that was not actually a part of my geometry. That was just to assign mesh control. So that should tell you that, you know, you've assigned that correctly, right? So then I move on to the create surface mesh part. And these are the global size controls, right? This is what will be applied by default if you haven't assigned a local sizing to any particular region. So you have both these big red boxes showing you the maximum element size. Then if you zoom in, you also have the smaller elements represented by these smaller red preview boxes. So I'm definitely going to increase the minimum mesh size in the interest of time. And let's just make this 40. So as soon as I make this 40, you can see that, you know, the boxes increase in size. I'm not going to play around much, much with the curvature normal angle, but I'm going to increase the cells per gap to two. Now, I am assuming that a lot of you are already familiar with these sizing functions from ANSYS meshing. However, if you're not familiar with these sizing choices and, you know, you need a little bit more guidance or uh, maybe a session dedicated to something more advanced, uh, please let me know in the survey. Uh, I'll also be launching a poll, a poll at a later point during this demonstration. So you can indicate whether you'd need a more advanced example uh, in a future ABA session. So basically cells per gap tells me how many element layers do I want in a narrow region, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and create the surface mesh. So while this is happening, let me see. So let me see some of the questions. Someone is asking, does the size of the mesh affect the results or the solutions? Yes, it does. Um, in CFD, we have something called grid independence, where you, know, you need to refine your mesh understand until your solution becomes independent of the mesh. Until that point, your mesh is either too coarse or your result is fluctuating with the number of cells in your domain. So the size of the mesh and the uh, you know, quality of the mesh definitely has an impact on your CFD solution. Is it possible to obtain the geometry used in the webinar? I will have to check on that um, because this is from the ANSYS database. So I'll need to ask them if this can be shared. If it can be shared, you know, I'll definitely email it to you. And um, yeah, I might not go through all the questions at this point, but you know, keep them coming and you know, we can address them later in the Q&A session. So, see it didn't take a lot of time and a very good quality surface mesh was automatically generated with very few inputs from me. Like I hardly entered two or three numbers and two or three fields. So you can see how easy and streamlined this process is and anybody can actually uh, start playing around with it and you know gradually improve their <coughs> CFT meshing capabilities, excuse me. <coughs> so yeah, one thing that I'd like everyone to notice is right now all the surface elements that you see, they're triangular. And the reason why I'm po pointing that out, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> just give me a minute, I'll drink some water. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because when we do the polyhex core meshing, you'll notice that these triangular elements change into polygons. So for now, um, this mesh looks good enough. Let us see what happened in the holes where we assigned two millimeter face sizing. So if I were to select the nodes individually, so suppose these two nodes, and if I were to examine this, so you can see that it's around 1.9 millimeters, so close enough to what, um, to the sizing that we specified, right? Okay, all right. So let's move on to the next step. Now it asks us to describe the geometry, why? Because right now, all we have in our domain are solid regions. 
we don't really have a closed fluid region where we want to run our CFD, right? We just have the clean solid geometry without any leaks or holes, right? So we will have to create your fluid uh, domain. This can be done in space claim as I've demonstrated in a previous AVA session. But since we didn't do the step for, the, uh, for this particular geometry, let's go ahead and do that in ANSYS Fluent right now. So let us see, what are the questions that it's asking? Geometry type. The geometry consists of only solid regions. Yes, that is correct. Right now it only consists of solid regions. So I'm gonna leave this as it is and then move on to the next question. Will you cap openings and extract fluid regions? Yes, I will have to in order to create a fluid domain. Now, the next question is, change all fluid fluid boundary types from wall to internal. Yes, why? Because if for example, there are two adjacent fluid domains and the boundary between them is a wall, then the fluid from one domain will not move to the other domain. Right, so you need to ensure that the boundary between those two different fluid domains is internal boundary so that flow can flow from one region to another. Right, do I need to share topology? No, I don't need to share topology because um, right now uh, uh, it's already been done in space claim, but. Keep in mind, this is again another option that you have in ANSYS Fluent, that if you haven't performed shared topology in space claim, you can do that in Fluent. But keep in mind that even though it gives you an option of doing shared topology, it needs to be watertight still. It cannot have gaps between them or it cannot be intersecting. So it needs to be a clean CAD and then you can perhaps come to Fluent and do a shared topology. Otherwise, uh, for all cases, I recommend that, you know, it is done in space claim itself. So I'll go ahead and select describe geometry. So now it'll ask me for the enclosing fluid regions. How do I cap the fluid regions? What boundaries do I select to create those um, fluid domains? So let me just deselect the clipping planes that I have the entire geometry. I have already assigned some names in space claim. So JD, this is what I was talking about that, you know, when you import from space claim, you have the option of assigning your name selections and it becomes very easy for you to pick those options in Fluent. So it's very compatible with what you can do in space claim. So right now we're gonna enclose the fluid regions. I have two velocity inlets and one pressure outlet. So I'm gonna go ahead and name this as inlet one. It is a in velocity inlet. I select inlet one over here and select on enclose fluid regions. So when it's capping your fluid region, remember it has to create another mesh uh, because it's ba basically uh, creating another boundary uh, which caps your domain. So this is what it created. So this is the boundary that I had selected for the capping region and this is how it capped it off. So this mesh was generated after I uh, created this enclosed fluid regions capping. So this is just one, we need to cap this opening, this is another inlet, and then we need to cap the outlet as well. So let me go ahead and do that really quick. And then the last one is the outlet, which will be a pressure outlet. So I'm gonna select outlet one and then go ahead and cap it off.
so you can see. Now everything is capped. This region is also capped. This region is also capped. And this region is also capped. So basically what we've done is we've created a fluid domain that is enclosed by another solid domain. Now, if you wanted to do a heat transfer problem, you might want to retain both this fluid and solid domains. But in the essence of saving time, I am only going to be working with the fluid domain for this particular demonstration. So I'm gonna go ahead and create regions. Now, Fluent automatically estimates how many fluid regions there are. Since this is a continuous domain, Fluent is telling me that there's just one fluid domain. So Fluent basically does most of the work for you if you're using these guided workflows. So I'm just gonna go ahead and select Create Regions. And now, if you see, this is just the internal fluid domain. You don't see the solid domain anymore. You could, if you go to this draw region section, and if you were to select solid regions, it would show you just the solid regions. And if you wanted to see just the fluid regions, it would just show you the fluid regions. So this is all still surface mesh, right? And this is all triangular elements still. So I'm gonna go ahead, everything looks okay to me. This has been extracted well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and update the regions. So with very little input from me, Fluent is automatically detecting, you know, based on curvature, based on proximity, based on the borderline geometry, what the mesh size should be in that particular region. And you can see these are like really good quality meshes. Like if I were to do this manually, even I wouldn't be able to get such a good mesh, even after spending a lot of time, right? So once it has done that, this is also green. We move on to the next step. It's asking me if I want to add boundary layers. Yes, I want to add boundary layers. Why? Because I have walls in my domain. So I do want to capture the near wall effects. Um, I'm not gonna change much. I'm gonna leave uh, you know, this with the default settings. It's asking me if I want to add the boundary layers in the fluid regions only. Yes, only in the fluid regions. And I want them on the walls. So I'll go ahead and select add boundary layers. Right now I'm just working with the default three, uh, again in the interest of saving time, but if you wanted to have more boundary layers based on your geometry and application, uh, you can change that part. So a lot of this is similar to ANSYS meshing, but so much more advanced. Um, and I'm sure everybody who's used ANSYS meshing will agree with me. So this part is done as well. And then finally, we come to the last step, which is creating the volume mesh. Now, because we talked so much about mosaic meshing technology, let me go ahead and select the polyhex core option. Now, this is what the mosaic meshing I was um, talking about is all about, when you have hexahedral cells in the bulk of the domain and then polyhedral cells to kind of transition from the prism layers at the boundary to the hex. Uh, mesh in the interior. And I also have the parallel meshing option checked. So I'll just go ahead and create the volume mesh. And this will take around a minute or so uh, to get completed. And while that is happening, I'm gonna launch another poll because I want to know um, Oh, you guys already uh, filled in the poll for the advanced meshing. Okay. Then I'm gonna launch another poll for the fault tolerant meshing. I'm sorry, I launched the other poll uh, first. So let me go ahead and launch this one. So if you guys wanna see for dirty CAD, uh, wherein you basically wrap the mesh around the geometry instead of actually meshing the surfaces of the geometry, 
then please go ahead and you know fill in the poll and we can have a future session to cover that as well that's something that you know uh, is very beneficial for people who work with complex geometries if somebody has a lot of components uh, that they cannot manually rectify or clean up then the fault tolerant meshing workflow will prove to be useful so that too is uh, task based Hey, Snigga, uh, while we're waiting for this mesh. So, as JD, you were breaking up. If I heard you correctly, you asked what is the advantage of using a polyhedral mesh? Yeah, over, uh, over the mesh that we... Okay, got it. So, that is actually a very good question. Um, and, you know, it's a legitimate question because a lot of people might just be using the standard unstructured tetrahedral meshes uh, for their CFD applications. So what is the buzz about polyhedral cells? Why, uh, why you know, do I advertise it or why do I talk about it? Now, two things. First, if you look at tetrahedral elements, you know, they can get highly skewed, right? Because they have to conform to these different you know, curvature surfaces and complex geometries. So that can result in you know, poor quality meshes or if you're trying to kind of save on the quality, you tend to have more tetrahedral cells in any one particular section of the domain. So you basically increase your solve time, right? So it's, you have to compromise on one end or the other. The second thing about polyhedral cells is, you know, they have more faces than a tetrahedral element, right? So for example, if you have a given computational section, you know, suppose some area, and you want to fill it with polyhedral cells and you want to fill it with tetrahedral cells and you want to compare the mesh count. Because the polyhedral cells have more faces, you will essentially need less number of polyhedral cells to mesh the same region as compared to tetrahedral cells. So you see, you basically benefit from, you know, uh, uh, the, of reducing the uh, solve time by having polyhedral elements. And because ANSYS generates these really high quality polyhedral elements, you will notice that, you know, they have zero warp on their faces. So if you look at any of these polyhedral cells, they, they're flat, right? They don't have any curvature to it. So what happens is if you look at two adjacent polyhedral cells, the cell center vector, the vector that connects these two cell centers, it's always gonna be normal to the common face between these two cells. So you are essentially retaining your orthogonality and that is always beneficial for a CFD case. So I hope JD that answers your question. But yeah, you see the volume mesh is complete and uh, the console gives you the mesh quality as well. So it took around two and a half minutes for this mesh to be generated. But look at the quality, it's, it's beautiful you notice that there aren't any triangular elements anymore. What you have is basically hexahedral elements in the interior of your domain. And then you have, uh, you know, these uh, prism layers and polyhedral cells towards the boundaries. In this particular region where we assigned a body of influence, you see the refinement. So even though it was not very visible in the surface mesh, in the volume mesh, you can notice how including that body of influence uh, basically helped us in getting a more refined mesh in this region. So with minimum, with minimal input, we are able to get such a good quality mesh everywhere. So you see these prism layers over here near the wall. And uh, So right now, by mistake, I had selected mesh solid regions, which is why it took two and a half minutes. Um, but if I were to just mesh the volume at, uh, fluid region, it would take, take even less time. So yeah. And with that, you know, like I conclude the demonstration. Uh, I think, you know, I'll run a little bit over time. <laughs> so I just wanna, you know, highlight the key takeaways. Uh, from my presentation today. One, that, you know, fluent meshing is really powerful. With very less input, you get um, very efficient output in terms of optimal mesh quality. 
uh, least number of cell count. And um, just the ease of setting it up uh, can be leveraged easily by anyone who's starting off with CFD. Um, again, I want to stress on the advantage of the mosaic meshing technology allows you to uh, have transition layers between different types of elements in different regions of your computational domain. So uh, if you're looking for more accurate CFD solutions, then mosaic meshing technology is the way to go. And lastly, uh, if you have a clean CAD geometry, please, I would encourage everybody to use the watertight geometry guided workflow. Um, one or two times add local sizings and see if you can play around with the output. And I'm sure you'll start uh, using it more uh, in the future for all your meshing workflow applications. And uh, yeah, that concludes my presentation. Let me go through the question answers. What is the best process flow to achieve mesh independence? Well, you know, usually there are some papers out there um, that uh, I studied when I was in grad school and you have certain ratios by which you need to kind of scale your element sizes and see how the mesh is changing. Um, I can, you know, look up that paper and send it your way. I don't remember the name of the uh, exact writer. I don't know if it was a paper by Patrick J. Roach, but uh, I can send you a paper that talks about the uh, scaling factors for your meshes and how you can ascertain uh, based on your uh, uh, grid independence index, whether your mesh, uh, whether your solution is finally mesh independent or not. Um, can a mesh created using fluent watertight geometry workflow be exported into a format that can be read by other software, for example, ANSYS Mechanical or Abacus? That is actually a very good question. I know that the meshes are stored in the standard, you know, fluent meshing format. Uh, so anything that would be true for fluent meshing, uh, is also applicable to watertight geometry, but I can definitely check in that and you know get back to you whether that can be done or not. Uh, another question. Is there a way of seeing mesh quality statistics like in ANSYS meshing? Right, so the console that I was just, um, let me share my screen real quick. So if you look at the console over here, you can see that it gives you the inverse orthogonal quality um, and also the orthogonal quality in general. With polyhedral cells, like I said, there is no concept of skewness. So ideally, like traditionally uh, for CFD meshes, you would check skewness uh, and you would want it to be less than 0 0.9. But because in this example, I'm using polyhex core meshing because I'm using you know, polyhedral cells, it's not really showing me the skewness factor, but if you use stat meshes, um, you know, the console will be able to you know, show you the mesh statistics for sure. So see you guys uh, next to next Tuesday and stay healthy. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks everybody. Bye.